So are there are there any are there any things that are going on in that realm? Let's let's just say like the pastoral tr- training realm. Yeah. That have you worried, or no? Um, or you can punt. Yeah. Some some of it. No, I don't. I don't need a punt. I mean, some some of it would be a perpetual worry that we exalt academic discussion over pastoral functioning. Hmm. Meaning, for example, and I blah blah blah. The seminaries can't teach you everything. That's fine. I, I don't even mean the seminary specifically, but like the capacity to plant a church. Where is somebody going to go learn that in the Lutheran Church Missouri Center? Mm. We sort of used to have something called Center for U.S. Missions that did that. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm. So there are capacities that I think we need generally. So if you say, well, hey, this guy speaks fluent Cantonese, he probably needs to plant a church because the number of existing positions where that's useful is much lower than the need for churches in that language, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or this guy is actually from Maine, where we have two churches, three churches, something like that, yep. mm-hmm. right? Um, that was my circuit. I was in southern was, New Hampshire, and part of my circuit was Maine. And I think you're right. We had maybe two or three. Imagine you were in Wisconsin or Minnesota mm-hmm. and your circuit is like multiple states. Yeah. Right. So if I want something like the density of churches that I have in southern Minnesota in every state, which I think would be reasonable, I would say we're just one denomination. We are reasonably and maybe even above expectation serving the human population, whatever their prior religious affiliation is, with having 200 churches per however many people live in the southern third of the state of Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's that's all I'm asking for Maine, for California, for Florida, in addition to Minnesota and Wisconsin and Iowa. If I just have an upper Midwest density of churches, and that's my target, what do I need to do that? How many different languages do I need? Maybe in Maine, I don't need that many different languages. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I might need French, maybe. I mean, way up in northern you Maine. You might, yeah. <laughs> I might, right? Yeah. Um, how many different languages do I need? How many guys do I need? And how do I answer that need? Now I'm asking the kinds of questions that I think, because I think you need to start with, what does the output need to be? And then you can fight over how that happens and how you get the guys there. And do they need like, like, here's a little hobby where I think Vicarage should be like three or four years long. Like, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. And I think guys learn more, more quickly when they're doing than when they're just in a classroom arguing about the meaning of John 6. Mm-hmm. Personal hobby horse, right? It doesn't really matter until and unless um, we know how many guys we need to either go on a one-year vicarage or no vicarage or four years. I, I don't care. That's why I don't care. Mm-hmm. Because I don't think we have a clear understanding of what the output needs to be. Are there people pushing for that that you find? And you don't have to name names. But like, Long do, do you, vicarages? Well, just, um, just more so the focus on here's what we need and let's reverse engineer it. Yeah. Um, no, not generally. Mm-hmm. I find, I, I find, I, and I, I'm not saying nobody, I, I, I'm saying dom, the dominant voices. I could go to best practices conference. I could go to Bugenhagen conference. I could, I could find my opposing sides of anything in the LCMS is that it's always about the LCMS. Mm-hmm. It's always about positions of influence, positions of power. I don't like this guy. I don't like what he's saying. Of course, I'm not talking to him. Mm -hmm. I'm not publicly responding to him. I'm just, I'm just in my group chat complaining, Mm -hmm. right? But that none of that has to do with how many people live in the state of Maine Mm -hmm. and what churches are serving them and where we could put more churches or what, I mean, like it, which is to me, that's, that's like, I, I compared us to a dysfunctional Krispy Kreme franchise. Yeah earlier is like, that's like saying like, I don't really know or care how many people want or need or enjoy donuts. Yeah. It doesn't matter to me. I'm all about who has too many franchises uh, that wasn't allocated fairly by headquarters. I'm all about who's at headquarters right now. I'm all about who's moving on from headquarters. You see how stupid this is in some Mm -hmm. way, because it's not a, I mean, you you could end up living in a world where no, everybody's like Krispy Kreme donuts are so bad for you. Don't see that's Christianity. It's yeah. so bad for you. Don't go eat these donuts. Like please don't. This is horrible. Look at the the trans fats, the seed oils. It's horrible for you. Don't. And now everybody's becoming convinced that Krispy Kreme donuts are horrible. 
and now the, the locations are closing and I'm still complaining about who is like assistant to the CAO at wherever headquarters is. Who cares? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter because soon nobody's going to be eating donuts and then nobody's going to have a job at headquarters, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's why it's kind of like if we don't look at outputs and we don't have a clear vision of where we're going with the outputs and the outputs being congregations and pastors in those congregations, then the rest of it kind of doesn't matter because it's kind of like there is a battle being fought, but we're basically disinterested in it. Yeah. So the army might end up surrendering or just being destroyed, but we'll deal with that later. That's a normal historical thing, isn't it? Like with Rome, wasn't that? I, mean, I might be completely off, but that was part of the downfall of Rome, right? Yeah. Was like the Turk or not the Turks, the, was it the uh, the Germanic tribes, right? The, yeah. What's the proper name for that? Either way, Germanic tribes yeah, come, coming in, right? And it, they were barbarians. The barbarians, the barbarians right? Like they were unified, <laughs> and they were they were they were at war. Yeah. And Rome was also was was you know completely distracted with with what's going on in the yeah. capital city, and therefore right. they were not ready to fight the battle. Well, they had they had issues also with at before a certain point, which side of the empire is going to have more or less power. And part of the reason that Constantine matters so much in Roman terms, not just in Christian terms, is that he unifies control in a way that in previous generations, it had been split between the East mm -hmm. and the Western have parts of the empire. They're not really halves geographically, but parts. And when you have that bickering behind the lines, that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't help you at all. And generally, it severely harms you, mm -hmm. right? So this is a big debate. What's the turning point of our American Civil War? Well, one way to know how much the Western part of that matters, and l a little bit less than people think, where Lee is fighting McClellan and various people, is because in the West, the Confederacy loses tons of territory, partly because its generals despise each other. Hmm. Bragg, Johnston, they both despise Jefferson Davis. And everyone hates John Pemberton, who loses Vicksburg, which loses the Mississippi River, because he's actually from Philadelphia. So they don't trust him. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you have that fighting inside, it doesn't matter that your troops are brave, which I think our troops are brave. I mean, the people that I meet, especially most frequently in my own travels, are, I think, the, they're like always the best people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Always, you know, always. And you know, just wonderful, wonderful pastors, wonderful laymen, um, but they can't fight alone. We're not designed to be non-denominational. Mm -hmm. And here's a great little congregation holding out on its own. Well, someday the pastor's going to die. Where are you going to get another one? Mm -hmm. You know, you meet these people, but they're taking a lot of losses. They're very brave, but they are not necessarily backed up from behind. Okay because the system is kind of obsessed with itself. It's not obsessed with the front lines. And they are facing more assaults than ever. Mm -hmm. People are going away faster. People are coming less frequently to the divine service. All kinds of problems. We need to back those people up. Mm -hmm. And we need to actually prioritize them. So I've heard, I've heard some people say, I mean, it's, I've heard some people say like, well, there might be another split. And some people yeah. are proponents of having like a split within the LCMS, sure. right? Because so with that, I mean, What's your thought on? I don't know. I wouldn't say necessarily even the probability. What's your thought on that kind of idea that's set in with some people? Yeah. But then along with that, like, what what kind of things does there need to be a firm line on? Right. Yeah. Like at some point, like if I'm if I'm teaching Arianism. Yeah. And like ten other pastors yeah. are like at some point, no like the LCMS would say like there is a split in that. Right. Like you guys are removed from this. Yeah. Like what what kind of lines are there there? But then what do you think about that mentality of a split? Yeah. I mean, desiring a split is desiring a split, not saying it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Desiring a split is is not a Christian attitude yeah. because you you want the body of Christ to be fractured. That's not a Christian attitude. Mm -hmm. Fractured even more than it's already fractured. Okay, So you're saying, uh, let's break a few more bones. Not good, right? But um, saying that it could happen is just historically wise because you're saying the dynamics ongoing in every other country and every other place and time could also occur here. Mm -hmm. Meaning, for example, churches will split for um, just blatantly political reasons. They'll be connected to theology, but at the time of our civil war, most denominations split north and south. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes explicitly on the basis of their understanding of the morality of slavery, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, and there's still a Southern Baptist convention and still called that for that reason hmm. originally. But, but for reasons like with other, not the Missouri Synod, but other Lutheran churches at the time, for reasons that are essentially political. They, they don't have a clear, in any way that could be explicable to normal people, theological distinction between them. They, they simply cannot get along politically. Mm -hmm. Or we have churches that have grown out of the LCMS that have become their own church bodies because they're in other countries, Brazil, Argentina, Canada. And that, that also is natural. And it's an essentially political division. We're not saying there's a theological difference. It's a political division. What happens in American society is it becomes extremely polarized. What happens, therefore, in our churches? I don't really know. Mm -hmm. But could it happen? Sure, it could always happen. Um, if you look back at the last time that we had a large split in the 70s, there were theological dimensions. There are also really predictable political dimensions. Your average guy who leaves the Missouri Synod in the 1970s is, I, I can tell you what he thinks about the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It's a little less decided among the guys who stayed, but I, I, it's pretty easy to tell you what a guy who graduated from Seminex thought about the morality of going into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that could happen. I think people think that once they split and are, quote, purer in the ways that now the United Methodist Church is very liberal and the Global Methodist Church is more conservative in American terms, um, politically and theologically, that somehow that will be better. Mm -hmm. It's possible. But I think you always have to keep the output in mind because the goal here is not to be purer than the driven snow on this earth. Because there are always, I mean, you can split, and you see this in the history of many very, they're called micro synods usually, but very small church bodies. They split, and then they split again later over an unforeseen issue because it turns out that people you can like always to fight. be purer. Yeah, there's always more to fight about mm -hmm. if you if you want to. If you don't keep in mind that the output is the delivery of the word of God in congregations to God's people, and and more people are gathered into that fellowship, then there's always there's always room to fix other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so you can split more if you want to. Um, I think what you will find is that the limits are wherever the word of God leaves them. The church generally doesn't know where those limits are until it has to fight about them. Yeah. yeah. You see that in the history of the creeds of the Lutheran confessions, of all kinds of things. The church usually is not sure what it thinks until it forces itself to think mm -hmm. because there's about to be a split or because there is a heresy being promoted. So that's really hard to predict because it's kind of like, well, we're, there are, yeah, there are definitely limits. We're going to find out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, Adam, do you have any quick closing thoughts? I'm just looking at the clock and I know you got to get to the airport. Yeah. So do you have a quick, any closing thoughts? Um, the quick closing thought would be just to encourage everybody who's watching or who's listening to understand that God's kingdom is under his control. Most people get despairing, um, and I think even more in our circles become cynical and cynically invested in political processes hmm. that cannot ensure the flourishing of the Word of God. What will ensure that is the actual work of personal and corporate reformation, mm -hmm. which is adherence to, submission to the Word of God in a way that has practical effect, that actually changes the way that we preach, the way that we think, the way that we live, that we would be renewed day by day. Um, I don't actually care about anything else. Mm -hmm. I really don't. And that's why I have spoken with the openness that I have to you today because I don't care about the rest of it, because mm -hmm. it actually doesn't matter. Mm. And if I did, then I would speak differently, and I would speak in a more guarded fashion about some of these things, because I would need to preserve certain political prerogatives you can have when you don't openly say, when you can't tell the difference between politics and the truth. 